Okay. I think we're ready. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, shush up with your too low FPS. It's still doing it to me every time. And I have no idea how I'm supposed to change that, but we'll worry about it another time. Um, anyway, hello, good evening. I'm Tad. Good to see you. Hope you're well. Um, hope you are surviving and uh, even thriving in the midst of all the silliness, strangeness, and worrisome stuff going on. Uh, we are all fine. We actually masked up and went out to a movie. Um, several of the young people in the house wanted to see um, the new Venom, uh, which I was quite willing to go see, not only because I've got I'm perfectly fine with Venom, but I'm also a big Andy Serkis fan, and Andy Serkis uh, directed this, so I was saying on the way back how pleased I was to see him get out of the uh, excellent work he's been doing, but just primarily as an actor and as a mocap specialist, motion capture, which has kind of become his, his calling card and his stock in trade um, because of you know, the uh, Planet of the Apes movies and, of course, Gollum and The Lord of the Rings and um, King Kong, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But he's also a wonderful actor, Andy Serkis is, in his own rights. And if you don't believe me, and especially if you are of a certain age, you should see his, um, his uh, wonderful portrayal of Ian, whoops, of Ian Dury. I can't think of the name of the movie right off the top of my head. Um, might be Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, because, of course, that's one of Ian Dury's famous songs, uh, but I'm not 100% certain. Anyway, he plays Ian Dury, the, the British um, musician, singer, songwriter, etc., cetera, um, who's a very wonderful and strange chap, and uh, it's, a, it's a real star turn. It's a brilliant piece of uh, filmic work. And so Circus has always been a really good actor, and I was very pleased to see him starting to branch out and get other kinds of work. And uh, as a director, he did a very good job. Um, as far as the film goes, if you're a, a you know, superhero, monster, science fiction fan, then you'll probably almost certainly enjoy it. Um, if you're not, it will probably <laughs> leave you somewhat bewildered. Um, I'm definitely, I, having grown up on comic books and having all the kind of comic book stuff been a major influence on me in my work, my writing, my, you know, all my creative procedures. Um, I'm a big fan and I'm just so happy that I got to stay alive until they were actually making decent movies based on the comic books that I grew up with. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, I'm always down for a good comic book movie. In fact, um, that's something that some people may not know is that uh, long before I thought I was going to be a writer, I thought I was going to be an artist and specifically a comic book artist. And um, I actually sent off a bunch of drawings to Marvel Comics back when I was about 16 and got a really nice or 16 or 17 and got a really nice letter back from John Romita, who was the art director at the time, saying basically send us some more stuff, you know, um, We'd love to see more, et cetera. And for a number of reasons, I can't remember, but basically teenage and early 20s, I, I never got around to it. And did kind of art, art and drawing kind of faded into the background. And then um, I wound up concentrating on music and theater and only later um, on writing. And again, Writing, as with art for me, was something that I could do in my own time. I didn't have to worry about other people not showing up or, you know, a, a bad director or, you know, whatever it was that I was having problems with. I didn't have to have a radio station, which you used to have to have in the old days. If you wanted to do radio, you can do it now from your computer. We didn't have that. Uh, we did not have that freedom at the time. So anyway, so I have a big, huge connection between me and comic books, um, and specifically the Marvel comic books of the 60s and 70s. And uh, so it's always a pleasure to go out to go see a good old-fashioned superhero movie, which is my, probably my version of like, you know, what the generation before me used to go see cowboy movies or gangster movies or something, you know. I, I don't claim they're all great art, but they're pretty decent art and they're a lot of fun. And so that's where we were this afternoon. But I kept my mask on 
that was I, I wound up sitting next to somebody else who was not wearing a mask so I had to keep my mask on for the whole movie um, because this guy was gonna just sit there and breathe on me um, anyway so what else to tell you guys we had a long conversation today with a friend in England um, who is kind of locked down there and she had just moved back to England from from the States uh, right sort of in the middle of the pandemic because she'd had it planned for a while so she doesn't get to see a lot of people and uh, as a result we we always you know we talk frequently on the you know do Skype back and forth so I did that today and then we zoomed off to the movie and uh, then it's about it I haven't had a chance to do any work today which is unusual because normally I work about seven days a week and if I don't if I have a day off for any reason I always feel super guilty about it um, which is why I often say I, I, I thought I had a succession of bad bosses in my working life until I became my own boss and realized that none of them were as wretched mean-hearted and evil-spirited as I am myself toward me. I, I never leave myself alone, and whenever I'm actually trying to take a little time off, my own boss voice is in the back of my head saying, you could be doing this, you could be doing that, it's not like someone else is going to do it for you, blah, blah, blah. Um, so anyway, so but I haven't done any work today. I feel quite like I'm playing truant, like I'm playing hooky and I've skipped out of school. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. Just the usual working, uh, working hard on Into the Narrow Dark and also doing some work on The Navigator's Children, which is the last part. Um, but I can't really finish The Navigator's Children until I've finalized all the details in Narrow Dark. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times, it's one of the weirdnesses about suddenly splitting a book in half. All of a sudden, they're on two different production schedules. So you can't fix the first half when you're writing the last half as you could if they were all one book. You know, that's that's the problem with these multi-volume things in general is that, you know, you're finishing the story after you've already published the early bits and you can't go back and fix anything. And this is actually making it happen with a single volume. Admittedly, a very long single volume. Um, so as a result, I am, uh, I am kind of just hacking along, doing what I can. Um, I haven't literally done this before. This is a new process because I've always known by the time that I was working on the, the last volume either that you know it was already it was going to be one single book like to Green Angel Tower or it was going to be like the last other land book or the last shadow march or whatever that you know that the others were done already and I was just working on the last one but this is the first time I've ever literally split a last volume in the middle while I'm writing it and had to work on them in two different phases albeit often concurrently. So it's a strange and interesting problem. I don't mean to make it sound all negative. It's, it's, you know, it's always interesting to do new things. But it does add some complexity and some difficulty to the situation. Um, but you'll all have, you know, within a year or so, you'll all have an opportunity to um, judge these things, I guess, for yourself. So you can let me know if I manage to pull it off or not. Um, although if I don't. It'd probably be nicer just not to say anything. And when you meet me, and you can just kind of go like, oh, yeah, hi, Tad. Hey, nice to see you. Um, yeah, that last couple of books, you know, and just kind of gloss over it. And I promise I will not ask any probing questions. <laughs> That's one of the things that I learned early on in our field in science fiction and fantasy, where you meet a lot of people, and oftentimes people you really, really like at you know, science fiction conventions and things like that. And sometimes when you're out on book tours and people come and introduce themselves to you, that nobody ever asks anybody else in the field, have you read my work? Because there's just no good answer to that. Usually if someone has read your work and likes it, they will say it immediately or say it very quickly. So the only other two alternatives are they haven't read anything of yours, in which case, you know, they're going to be embarrassed if you ask them because, you know, you're putting them on the spot. Or worse, they've read some of your stuff and think it's nonsense or bad or whatever, or just didn't care for it much. Um, in which case, what are they going to say? You know, again, you're putting somebody in a bad position. So there's just this kind of unspoken thing in science fiction, fantasy, and probably other fields. 
but I only know my field where, you know, you meet someone and if you do know their work and like it, you oftentimes say so right away, just so they know where you stand. Um, and if you don't, you know, or, you know, if they're meeting you, it just sort of stays vague and nobody really mentions it. You know, you just kind of ignore it. Because there are probably a lot of people whose books are really good that I haven't read. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to imply that, you know, they weren't worth reading and that's why I haven't read them. But on the other hand, I can't say, I'm sure they're great because, you know, that's stupid. So you just kind of, you know, you just pretend you're all salesmen and you're in town for a sales convention or something. You know, you don't worry about whether anybody's read your stuff or not. One of the sad things, that last thing, and then I'll start reading. One of the sad things, though, is when you meet somebody and you really, really like them a lot. And then you afterwards, you say, well, I should pick up one of so-and-so's books. And you do and you don't like it. That's painful and difficult because if you like the person, you want to like what they're doing, too. But... You know, it, it's horses for courses. Not everybody likes everything. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't like my work who have perfectly legitimate reasons. You know, it just doesn't work for them for whatever reason. Anyway, so that's a whole pile full of thoughts that are of no use to anybody, but I have now disgorged them on to you so you can do what you want with those ideas, <laughs> whatever they may be. I am going to check in and see who is on in the magic mirror. Um, to make another call back to Romper Room. And the first is Parmalee Paula Cover. Hello, Paula. Good to see you. Or Parmalee. Um, I'm not sure if Parmalee is, a, is your name or is a designation or is a pseudo, pseudonymous uh, something or other. I realized I've seen your name for years and don't know that. So if you'd care to enlighten me uh, as to which you prefer, that's fine. I like Parmalee. I hope that's your first name. I would love to have a first name that cool. Justin, hello. Good to see you. Emily, good evening. Quite tired, but happy for stories. Three back-to-back -back conventions. Oh my gosh, that is sounds like a lot of work. And it's your oldest's 18th birthday. Oh, congrats to him. Um, yes, it is a him. Congrats. Lovely to hear it. And please give him my best wishes. Jim, yo. Happy Sunday to you too. Good to see you. Barban, hello and good evening. Kenneth, hello to you too. Good to see you. Medardo, bienvenido. Or bienvenido. Um, and hello and good evening. Yes, had a good week this week, generally. Cliff, yes, having a great day. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, got out to a movie. That's something. That's pretty exciting in this, these, these days of isolation and pandemic uh What's the word I want? Monasticism. Pandemic monasticism. Becca, good evening. The weeks seem to go by so quickly, says Becca. Yeah, it, it does. They all do to me, but that's because I'm old. Nancy, hello. Happy Sunday to you too. And Regina, hello, hello. Nice to see you. And Ray, greetings, greetings. Um, Jim, you know, Jim says, I wish we could read you stories someday. Well, maybe we can. We'll, th we'll think about how that might be arranged somehow. And there's Kristen. Hello, Kristen. Good to see you. Matthew, what does it mean when they say someone says they sat on their shoulder? Um, it depends on where you use it. It oftentimes means that somebody was kind of stuck very close and sort of gave them advice I believe is the, what the usual meaning of that phrase is. You'll have to let me know where that comes from. Is that something that I wrote somewhere or is that something you ran across somewhere else? But that's usually what it means. It means that somebody kind of stuck really close to somebody and kind of kept an, usually a watchful but benevolent eye on them anyway. Uh, Kristen, hard to eat popcorn with a mask on. Yeah, fortunately, I wasn't trying to eat popcorn. That would have been very difficult. If I'd been farther down the line of where our row of seats was, I probably would have been stealing popcorn from my kids. But as I said, I was sitting next to a guy who was very definitely not masked. And um, just as a, you know, just as a, uh, a precaution, um, I kept mine on for the whole thing. Because again, we've got a daughter who has some uh, immune problems and, you know, want to do our best to protect her. Claudia, hello, good to see you. And who else? Carl, hello, good evening. Kelly, good to see you too. And Chris, hola, senor, nice to see you. Jeremy, hello, good to see you, Jeremy, as always. 
Chris says hello to all. Josh, might like how Jaws was better for the shark never working. It might end up like how the Jaws was better for the shark never working, which which might end up something that I was just saying probably. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, that actually is a classic example of, of uh, show, don't tell, or in this case, don't show, don't tell, which was what Spielberg did when he couldn't get his mechanical shark to work. Everything had to be mood and psychology. So that was very, 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 a very uh, fortuitous discovery and made the movie much, much better. But then again, my favorite scary movies are the kinds that are psychological anyway, rather than the like, oh, look, this is what it looks like when you tear somebody's face off with a, a melon baller. You know, that doesn't do as much for me. Chris says, Tad. Hmm. Oh, no, I didn't know that about the new iPhones, that they had that dictation process. Oh, that is very cool. Well, I hope there are some people who are hearing impaired who are doing just that. Um, Josh says, I'm sure there are plenty who don't like my work, and then says, Philistines. And it's so true. And wasn't it the Philistines that Samson went after with the jawbone of an ass, too? So, you know, that seems appropriate. Um, okay, who else have we got here? I haven't said hello to everybody yet. Uh, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Josh. Josh's wife was actually on Romper Room. The doobie made her cry. Oh, don't be a doobie who makes people cry. That's so sad. Um, I was never on Romper Room. I was almost on Mayor Art, but that was our local show. Uh, Kyra. Hello, Kyra. Nice to see you. Oh, IK, okay. Josh's remark about the Jaws shark is having to complete and finalize the first half before finishing the second half. Yeah, possibly so. We'll see. Uh, it's not like I have any choice. Carolyn, hello, my dear. Lovely to see you. Um, yeah, of course, go order your dinner, but very, very nice to see you, as always. I think of you often, so my dear friend. Um, anyway, so that's a nice surprise. I am going to now start reading. Tom, ba -da, where am I? There I am. Okay. Um, as I said before, they, the comments used to be up in this section of my desktop when I was doing this, and I could see them at the same time that I was doing the, uh, that I was making sure that, you know, I was more or less on camera and things like that and making eye contact. That is no longer the case because of the helpful folks at, as I said, either Google Chromebook or at Facebook um, who have rearranged everything for me. Okay. So we are reading, as you probably remember, The Dragons of Ordinary Farm, written by, whoops, moi, and ma femme, Deborah Outbeal. And Deborah and I wrote this back in the, God, I guess I must, what did we say the publication date on this was? It's horrifying now how everything is like way in the past. 2009. So it was when this edition was published. So even there, that's 12 years ago. And as far as I'm concerned, 2009 is already, is still hopelessly far in the future. I'm still not used to 2001 not being in the future. I'm not even used to 1984 not being in the future. So there you go. Okay, so we're about to start chapter 15. And you can't really see that very well. It's so tiny, but that's a gate with the word Cresta Soul on it. And the name of the chapter is Beating the Big Crab. So we continue with the Dragons of Ordinary Farm. Oh, Tyler, you really should have seen him, Lucinda said as she climbed up next to him in the wagon. It was the most, I was so scared, but he was beautiful too. Like a snake or a lizard. No, like a bat. I, I don't know. And he was all shiny and he, he breathed fire and I was so scared. I thought he was going to kill us. I, I was sure I'd die. It was the day after Lucinda's dangerous adventure and she still hadn't stopped talking about it. Tyler was getting a little tired of hearing the story over and over and glad that she wouldn't be able to talk about it at the Carrillo's house. He was also grumpy because with the upset last night and all the attention given to Lucinda, he hadn't found time to have a proper look at Octavio Tinker's journal or what remained of it. 
Still, Tyler supposed he'd feel a whole lot worse if his sister had been turned into a dragon barbecue. And Haneb, he was so brave, did I tell you? Yeah, you told me. He stepped right out in front of it and he told me to go in the shed and hide. I thought he was going to get burned to bits. If it wasn't for, for Mr. Walkwell ringing that bell, the, the dragon would probably have, have killed us both. Alamu, right, it's Alamu, Lucinda added breathlessly. That's the dragon's name, Alamu. She said it more like the name of some new boy in school than of something that had almost turned her into fried chicken. He's really scary, Alamu, I mean, and beautiful, but amazingly scary. You were lucky, girl, said Ragnar as he finished adjusting the horse's harness. The yellow-haired man had carried her back to the house, wrapped in a blanket after the dragon had flown away. Lucinda had been shivering so much her teeth clicked together. Yes, Haneb was brave, but if Mr. Walkwell had not rung the feeding bell over at the reptile barn, you still might have been killed. But I, I, I wanted to ask you last night, how did Mr. Walkwell even know what was happening to us? We have a tracking device on the male dragon, announced Colin Needle. He had come out silently and stood in the doorway listening. I found it at a scientific supply company on the internet. We always have to know where he is just because of things like what happened last night. Aren't you coming to the party, Colin? Lucinda asked. No, I have a lot of important things to do. Tyler wondered what could be so important that it was worth skipping a party, especially when you lived on an isolated farm. It's really too bad you can't go, Lucinda said. It sounds like it's going to be fun. For a moment, Colin Needle showed something like genuine regret. He actually looked human. It's all right. The Carrillos, well, they don't like me much. Gee, said Tyler, I wonder why. Be quiet, Lucinda elbowed her brother hard. Nobody likes you, Tyler Jenkins. Collins stood and watched as Ragnar flipped the reins and the, ho and the horse started around the long gravel driveway. Have a good time, he said, then turned and walked back into the house. We can't leave yet, Ragnar said. We are still waiting for Simos. Mr. Walkwell's going with us? asked Tyler. He likes the Carrillo clan. Ragnar grinned. Ha, I will tell you one thing from yesterday that would make even the gods laugh. When the dragon came, Simos himself drove the truck to the reptile barn. I did not know he even knew how. He turned to Tyler. He did not waste time looking for me or Gideon. When he learned your sister was at the sick barn with Alamu, he knew he had to go quickly. Cool said Tyler. He wished he'd seen it. Mr. Walkwell forced to deal with the modern world. I hope it didn't hurt his poor feet, Lucinda said dreamily. Then, when he came walking back, Ragnar went on, chortling, all he said was, someone go and get that stinking machine. Now I must bathe. Poor fellow. Mr. Walkwell appeared at last, and they set off. Tyler made a few driving jokes, but the wiry old man only glared at him, maintaining a dignified silence. The wagon rolled along through the valley and over the dry hills on the far side until they finally reached the road to the Carrillo's farm. Ragnar hopped down to unlatch the front gate, which was made of white painted iron bars and had a smiling sun beneath the letters, Cresta Soul Dairy Farm. It seemed like the kind of thing you would see in simple colors stamped on a carton of milk. After a moment, Tyler realized that it probably was just that, the logo for the Carrillo family's dairy. What's Cresta Soul mean, anyway? he asked. It sounds like a toothpaste. Maybe it's Spanish for my brother is very ignorant, Lucinda suggested. The long driveway was gravel, the huge front yard mostly dirt, except for an old swing set. Two figures Tyler recognized from the diner ran toward them, 
the boy, Steve, and his older sister, Carmen, laughing and shoving each other. Come on, Steve said when they reached the wagon. Alma's making something, so she's being all artistic and she won't come out. But we put the ping pong table up in the backyard and I've already beaten Carmen like a hundred times straight. Liar, his sister said. You only won the last time because I stepped on one of your dolls and almost broke my leg. It's not a doll, Steve replied with dignity. It's a collectible action figure of Helldiver from Deep End. Deep End? You play that? Tyler was more than interested. Play it? I totally own that puppy. Well, except the last level. Can't get past the Grand Central Crustacean. Oh man, that was so hard. Took me forever. Steve's eyes bugged out. You, you did it? You beat the crab? Once, yeah, but I was playing it on easy. Oh man, I don't care. You have got to come show me. Steve grabbed Tyler by the arm and dragged him toward the house, just as a woman in jeans and a top that looked like a painter's smock stepped out the door so they all nearly collided. She was about the same age as Tyler and Lucinda's mom, but she had long black hair pulled back in a ponytail and was a little shorter and a little more rounded. You two must be Tyler and Lucinda, she said. Stephen, quit yanking on the guest's arm. The crab, Mom! He totally knows how to beat the crab in deep end. I only did it once, Tyler protested. Oh, that does sound impressive, she smiled. However, Stephen, no disappearing to play games right now. Stay outside and show our guests around. You can all play something together. She turned to the new arrivals. Hi, I'm Sylvia Carrillo. Happy Fourth of July. Thanks for inviting us, Lucinda said. Do you want to play ping pong? Or come in and get something to drink? Carmen spread her hands out. She was wearing a grown-up looking bracelet full of jingling silver charms. Tyler had to admit she was kind of pretty for a girl his sister's age. Yes, everyone come in, said Sylvia Carrillo. Simos, Ragnar, can I get you men a beer? To take with me, please, Ragnar said. He looked genuinely regretful. I have work to do back at the farm, helping Gideon. I will come back tonight for everyone. Working? On the fourth? Sylvia laughed. You are way too dedicated. Steve and Carmen took them on a quick tour of the house. They looked into Steve's impressively neat room as they went by, and both boys gazed longingly at the game station. The youngest girl, Alma, waved shyly from the room she shared with Carmen. I'll be out in a minute, she called. Hi, Lucinda. Hi, Tyler. Happy Fourth of July. The Carrillos had more room than Tyler and Lucinda had at home with Mom, but their furniture was old and the television was small and the kids' clothes looked like hand-me-downs. Still, they seemed pretty cheerful. Tyler wasn't quite used to a family who joked without being mean and who seemed to have as much fun with each other as the Carrillos did. At last, they all trooped out to the covered patio in the backyard. At the edge of the patio, a man in a bright white shirt, jeans, and sandals was tending a brick barbecue. He turned as the children arrived, smiled just enough to make his mustache twitch, then returned his attention to the coals. My dad's not really as unsocial and rude as he looks, Carmen said loudly. He's just more interested in his barbecue than in people, right, Dad? Wait just a few minutes too long and the coals cool off, said Mr. Carrillo with his back to them. Then the meat doesn't cook right. That's science. Our father, Hector Carrillo, said Steve, props for the mad barbecue genius. They drank lemonade and played ping pong, and it was so normal and pleasant that for a while Tyler almost forgot about the mysteries of Ordinary Farm. Mr. Walkwell hobbled out to discuss the fine points of barbecue with Mr. Carrillo. The old man had said yes to red wine, and now he seemed to be enjoying himself. More Carrillo relatives arrived, aunts and uncles and cousins everybody putting food on the picnic table until it seemed there wasn't enough room left for people to sit and eat. 
Casserole dishes and salad bowls started to fill the ping-pong table, too. Oh, my God, said Lucinda. There's enough food here for an army. Yep, Tyler said happily. There sure is. A little old lady, so short and round she might have been a munchkin from the land of Oz, with hair the shade of red Lucinda was used to seeing on lead singers and punk bands, smiled and said, I hope you brought your appetites, children. This is Lucinda and Tyler, Grandma, Carmen said, from next door. This is my Grandma, Paz. Ah, the tiny old lady now looked at them more carefully, maybe even a little suspiciously, Tyler thought. You are the ones from the Tinker Farm, yes? They both nodded. She sighed. So young. Well, enjoy yourselves. She smiled sadly and headed back to the kitchen. Is it my imagination, said Tyler quietly to his sister as they got into line to fill the dinner plates. Or was she acting like we were going on some kind of suicide mission? By the time Tyler had emptied his third plate, he was seriously considering finding some place to lie down and die, but he knew he'd be dying happy. What had been most surprising about the day was how comfortable Mr. Walkwell seemed. He drank his wine, teased the Carrillo children, and talked at least a little bit with almost everybody. It seemed like an entirely different person had come to the party in a Mr. Walkwell costume. Tyler even saw him flirt a little with Grandma Paz, which made the old lady whoop with laughter and cover her mouth with a chubby hand. Little Alma had been standing near Mr. Walkwell for a long time, her hands behind her back. When he had finished talking to one of the Carrillo uncles, she stepped up and handed him a long something the size of a pencil case, wrapped in yellow tissue paper. Mr. Walkwell opened it up, but in such a way that Tyler couldn't see what was in it. Mr. Walkwell looked at it for a moment, then looked at Alma, who was stepping from one foot to the other as though she wanted to run away. He said something quietly to her, laid his big brown hand on top of her head, then put the package into the pocket of his overalls. She blushed furiously, but looked very happy. "'What's that all about?' Tyler asked. She's trying to learn how to carve wood like Mr. Walkwell, Carmen said, so she probably made him a present. She's getting pretty good, Steve said. She made me a T-Rex out of soap, but I left it in the shower. <laughs> now it's kind of a half-Rex. You must be very, very careful, said Grandma Paz. Tyler and Lucinda put down the dirty dishes they had carried into the kitchen. They're doing fine, Mama, Sylvia Carrillo said. I don't mean that. The old woman shook her head. I mean where they stay. That Tinker Farm, it is a dangerous place. Tierra Peligrosa. Don't start with the stories, Mama, please, begged Mrs. Carrillo. Everybody knows. My own abuela, my grandma, she was Yaudanchi an Indian. She told me the stories. Back then, when the Indians lived here, a man went to find his wife, who died. He followed her track all the way to that place, that valley. He found a big hole in the ground that led to the underworld, the place of the spirits. When he got there, he found all the ghosts of all the people that ever were. Mama, quit trying to scare these poor children. Not scare, warn, the old woman said stubbornly. My abuela, she said that one day the ground would open up and all the world would fall into the place of the spirits, that the ghosts would come out, ghosts and monsters. Oh, cool, Grandma's telling a story, Steve said, walking into the kitchen with a stack of salad bowls. Carmen, come on. Monsters, asked Tyler. Lucinda looked really worried, but whether it was about the story or Tyler's questions, he couldn't tell. Uh, what kind of monsters exactly? But before the old lady could answer him, Mr. Carrillo popped his head through the door. It's just about dark, he said. Anybody want to see some fireworks? You kids go, said Mrs. Carrillo. My mother and I are going to finish the dishes, and 
have a discussion about how to treat guests. Mr. Carrillo had a big family-sized box of fireworks, the kind that Lucinda and Tyler had always been told were too dangerous to use. <clears throat> As he and the other men set them up on the wide expanse of dirt in front of the house, Mrs. Carrillo emerged. She uncoiled the garden hose and handed it to Steve. If any sparks go up, then you put them out, she told him. But I want to do some of the fireworks. Honey, there's no wind, and the things are 50 feet from the house, protested Mr. Carrillo. But Sylvia Carrillo was unmoved. Yes, that all sounds good until the house catches on fire, she said. Steve, you stand there with that hose. It was half an hour after the last true volcano blossom had sputtered out. Everyone had run out of things to do except sit around the back patio, stuffed and content, listening to the returning noise of the crickets and Mr. Walkwell blowing quiet tunes on a simple wooden flute. The gift, Tyler realized, that Alma had carved for him. He could tell because of the enraptured way Alma sat at his feet watching the old man play. The tune was so strange and the evening so warmly magical that he didn't even notice the large approaching shape until Ragnar stepped from the driveway into the soft light of the back porch. Sorry I am so late come, he said. A lot to do. Do you want anything to eat, said Mrs. Carrillo. There's plenty left. I thank you, but no, he said smiling. I think I will carry this group back. Tomorrow is not a holy day like today, so we will be early to work. Let me send some back with you then, she said. We have plenty of leftovers. While she dragged Ragnar into the kitchen to load him down with chicken, potato salad, and black beans, Steve sidled up to Tyler. Quick, dude, he whispered. Just show me how to do the bubble cave. They hurried into Steve's room and fired up deep end and Tyler gave him a quick tutorial on how to pick out the non-exploding bubble to ride through the cave and on to the next level, then left the other boy struggling with the grotto of ghouls and went looking for the bathroom. Through the open bathroom window, he could hear Mr. Carrillo and Mr. Walkwell talking. The word trouble caught his attention, and instead of turning on the water to wash his hands, he moved closer to the screen. That's all. I know he likes to keep his business to himself, but he needs to know about this. What kind of men? Mr. Walkwell asked. They did not come to the house. Men in suits. They said they were with the Agriculture Bureau, but Hartman said they were in town the, the day before and bought gas with a mission software credit card. That's that guy Stillman's company. You know Stillman, the guy who's in the news all the time? Do you think they're trying to find a place around here to open a factory or something? Who, who knows? Mr. Walkwell was doing his best to sound like he didn't care, but Tyler could hear something strange in his voice. Was he a little drunk? But if they come spying around the farm, I will teach them a lesson. Don't get yourself in trouble, Simos, said Mr. Carrillo. The two of them wandered away from the vicinity of the window, still talking. Tyler washed his hands and went out, his head full of confusing information. Men in suits, asking about the farm? Old Indian ghost stories. He had thought things were already as strange as they could get. Apparently he had been wrong. On the way back to the farm, with the stars spread overhead and the horse clop-clopping along, nobody spoke for a long time. At last, Lucinda asked, Ragnar, why do the Koreas keep talking about ghosts at Ordinary Farm? I, I don't think they know about the dragons or anything, but their grandmother was telling this story about... Uh, about... The place of the spirits, said Tyler. She said there were ghosts under the house or something like that. Ragnar nodded, but as if he was thinking rather than agreeing. I do not think there are ghosts under the house, he said at last. I think that is fair to say. Lucinda had grown dreamy again. 
her voice soft, she said. When is Uncle Gideon going to tell us what's really going on at Ordinary Farm? Tyler was glad she was doing the asking for once, but he knew they weren't going to learn anything that way. Ragnar shook his head. I have nothing to do with that child. I hope it's not dead people, Lucinda said drowsily. I hope Grandma Paz was wrong about that. I don't want to have to meet any dead people. Ragnar breathed in sharply, but said nothing. Mr. Walkwell, sitting beside him, made a sound that Tyler at first thought was a laugh. He only realized when he heard it a second time that the old, that the old man had quietly begun to snore. All right, and now we start chapter 16. Whoops, let me get that in the right place. And this chapter is called Humpty Dumpty's Hanky. It isn't like you to go into town, young fellow, said Gideon. Are you courting someone? The young woman at the dairy duchess stand, perhaps? Colin tried to smile at the old man's heavy-handed humor. No, sir, I just wanted to do some shopping. Look at some computer magazines. Well, well, it's a pleasure to have you, of course. I won't be able to spend any time with you. I have a very important meeting, but you'll find plenty to do, I'm sure, a young fellow like you. He said it as most old people did, as though Colin was somehow being unfair just by being young. I'll find things to do, sir. Yes, certainly. I see you've got your briefcase with you. Very businesslike. Gideon had brought along a case of his own, or rather a large box that Ragnar had stashed in the trunk while Colin watched from an upstairs window. Colin knew what was in the box, too, but he had not, of course, bothered to mention any of this. Where should we drop you off? Ragnar asked. The big man wanted it clear that Colin was getting out first so that he wouldn't be seeing where Gideon was having his important meeting. They thought they were so crafty. Colin almost laughed. Just at the store. Where should I meet you? And when? I can't imagine what I'm doing will take more than an hour, said Gideon. Why don't you meet us back at the cafe and we'll have a Sunday before we head back. Even your mother couldn't disapprove of that, could she? It's the day after the fourth, after all. We deserve a little celebration. Oh, yes, Gideon, said Colin, carefully suppressing any trace of sarcasm in his voice. That would be super. Colin knew exactly where Gideon was going, because the antiques dealer, Jude Modesto, had taken the bait of Colin's email and told him where they would be meeting at Gideon's secret office. Gideon Goldring was not the kind of man to transact his business in front of every curious soul in Standard Valley, and there were obvious reasons he didn't want to have Modesto, or anyone else, visit Ordinary Farm. So he had taken the precaution of leasing a tiny office in a small, half-built business park several blocks away from Standard Valley's main street. Luckily for Colin, it was still twenty minutes until Gideon's meeting, so the old man and Ragnar were going to get a cup of coffee. They invited Colin to join them at the cafe, but he declined politely. When they headed toward Rosie's, Colin walked into the general store, then straight through and out the back door. Once he was out of sight, he tucked his briefcase under his arm and began to sprint toward the business park. The building was small, and except for a chiropractor's office and a second-hand store that was apparently closed today, there were no, no other businesses yet in place. Gideon's office was on the second floor, above one of several empty, empty storefronts. Colin paused at the bottom of the stairs long enough to slow his breathing and wipe the sweat from his forehead, then walked up and pushed the door open. As Colin had hoped, Jude Modesto had let himself into Gideon's sparsely furnished office and was waiting. The antiques dealer was plump and pink, his bulk overflowing the inexpensive office chair, and he had a little tuft of a mustache which did not make him look as young and fashionable as he probably thought it did. 
Modesto's glasses slid halfway down his nose as he mopped sweat from his face with a handkerchief. "'You kept me waiting long enough,' he said crossly, staring Colin up and down. "'Look at you. You're just a kid. What do you want from me?' Colin was very conscious that Gideon Goldring would be coming through the door in less than a quarter of an hour, but he did his best not to look hurried. He settled into the big chair that he supposedly that he supposed must usually be Gideon's, unlatched his briefcase, then paused and gave the antiques dealer his sternest look. Just one question, Modesto. Are you rich enough? What nonsense is this? Modesto wiped his forehead furiously, as if to scrub away even the memory of being talked to that way by a mere boy. I'm a very important man, yes, I'm sure you are, but we're not talking about important, we're talking about rich. I'm asking whether or not you would like to be really, really rich. Are you happy dealing in trinkets, Modesto, setting things up for the people who have the real money, or would you like to get in on a truly big score? Colin hoped he wasn't overdoing the tough guy lingo. He'd written the whole speech out and memorized it the night before. A score that will set you up for life? Are you some kind of crazy person? Modesto struggled to get up out of the low chair. He looked like Humpty Dumpty about to fall off the wall. Look, kid, I got your email and I said I'd meet you. Fine, I've met you, and now you'd better get going. Just because you live in Tinker's house doesn't mean you have anything I'm going to... I... Have everything, Colin said harshly. Time was getting short now, and he had to hurry. You'll never get into Ordinary Farm on your own. Gideon Goldring will never let you. But if you help me, you'll get access to things you've never even dreamed of. Things that make those antiques you've been selling for him, those vases and obsidian knives, look like cheap souvenirs. You will be rich beyond your dreams. Are you really that sure you're not interested? Jude Modesto stared at him. Humpty Dumpty's handkerchief came out and went back and forth across the wide pink face. The chin with its little sandy beard twitched. What? What are you offering to get me onto the property? That's not going to happen. Now, as for what I do have, do you want to find out? Yes or no? Modesto glowered. You have five minutes, kid, the fat man said at last. Start talking. I won't need that much time, said Colin. Now listen, I'm going to give you something today, and you're going to take it with you and get it tested. When you do, you're going to be desperate to talk to me. You're going to want to come and camp out by the gates of the farm, but you're not going to do that. Instead, you're going to send me an email, and I, it's going to say one word, yes, and then I'll let you know where we go from there. Got it? Jude Modesto was clearly wrestling with a still strong impulse to heave himself up out of the chair and storm out of the room, but he was also impressed by Colin's certainty. You know you're a very rude young man. No, I just don't like to waste time. Here. Colin reached into his briefcase and pulled out a pill bottle. Inside the bottle, a small, pale chip sat on a folded piece of dark cloth. That little white thing? Modesto squinted as he took the bottle. What is it? That's for you to find out. Remember, you're not testing me. I'm testing you. I already know what it is, but I'd suggest you give it to someone discreet, someone you really trust, because you're not going to want this to be general knowledge. For the first time, Jude Modesto looked less than certain of himself, even a bit worried, as though Humpty Dumpty had just heard that all the king's horses and men might not honor their putting him together contract after all. Tested? Oh, yes. Oh, and I recommend you have it done by someone with training in biology. Modesto was about to ask another question when they were both distracted by noise outside the office. 
a car door slamming downstairs in the parking lot. If it was Gideon, he was ten minutes early. Colin felt like he was going to be sick. I have to hide, he said, looking around in terror. Why couldn't Gideon show up on time like he was supposed to? Where can I hide? Don't look at me, snapped Modesto, although he seemed nervous too. I didn't ask you to come. Colin wanted to hit the fat man. But if he finds me here, that's the end of a multi-million dollar deal for you. Now they could clearly hear footsteps on the concrete steps outside. Colin was thinking of trying to force the window open, despite the air conditioner built into the frame, when Modesto pointed at a couple of fabric partitions with metal frames standing against the wall. Hide behind those, he suggested, wiping at his sweating face again. But you better do it fast, kid. Colin set the two screens side by side, close to the wall, leaving room to hide behind them, but then realized that his feet would show at the bottom. He had just dragged a box behind one of the screens when the door of the office began to open. Colin jumped up on the box and held his breath. Modesto! Ah, I see you let yourself in. It was Gideon's voice, all right. Mr. Goldring, a pleasure to see you, sir. Yes, I'm sure. Gideon's chair squeaked as he sat down. You know Ragnar, I think. Mr. Lodbrok, nice to see you again said Modesto. Colin inched forward a little, doing his best not to bump the fabric, and put his eye to the crack between the two screens. If he hunched a little, he could just make out the area around the desk. Gideon looked wilted by the heat, his rooster comb of white hair a bit bedraggled. His eyes, though, were still bright and fierce. So, Modesto, I'm sure you'd like to know what we have in the box. Of course the dealer said, always the highlight of my day. No, my entire month. What have you brought me this time? Gideon carefully lifted something out of the box. Colin couldn't quite see it, but Jude Modesto obviously could. Goodness, he said. I mean, goodness. Is that a red-figured amphora I see? Oh, my, that's one of the most astonishing Greek vases I've ever seen. Might even be the Berlin painter. Might indeed, said Gideon, with a tone of deep satisfaction. But I'll leave that to the experts. I have a couple more pieces for you. Some Phoenician glass and a Mesoamerican obsidian knife should be worth a few dollars, he chuckled. Oh, yes, they're lovely, lovely. Oh, I'll have no problem selling these, Mr. Goldring. What a treasure trove old Mr. Tinker must have left you. I would dearly love to have a look at it all some day. Surely you should have the collection reappraised, just to make sure the insurance is adequate. No, no, I'm afraid not, Mr. Modesto. I have my ways, as you know, and I don't hold much with visitors. But you wouldn't even have to see me. I said no. Now, what do you think these might be worth? How much things were worth was a subject that interested Colin very much, and he listened carefully as Jude Modesto made an estimate and wrote out a check as an advance. It's still small change compared to what we could get, Colin thought. You think too small, Gideon, too small. Thank you, sir, said Gideon, tucking the check into his wallet. A pleasure doing business with you. Let me know when you've finished the appraisals and are putting the items up for... Gideon, said Ragnar suddenly, someone is coming up the stairs. And now Colin could hear it too, the thumping of what sounded like several pairs of heavy feet. No one could be, Gideon began lightly. Then suddenly his tone changed as the door opened. Colin couldn't see it, but he could see the look on Gideon's and Ragnar's faces, like a wolf had suddenly strolled out of the dark and into the middle of the camp. Into the middle of camp. What the hell is going on? Gideon demanded. Sorry to catch you by surprise, said Jude Modesto, suddenly so nervous he was stuttering a little. But I'd like to introduce you to my best client, Edward Stillman. Stillman? Gideon said it like the world's worst curse word. 
What the hell are you doing here? Modesto, you traitor! Ragnar turned on the antiques dealer. I should break your neck for this. Modesto squealed and tipped over his chair, trying to get away. In the excitement, Colin changed position so that he could get a better view. Three men stood in the doorway. Two of them were extremely tall, muscular, and bald so that they looked like twins, even though one was black and one white. It wasn't hard to guess that they were bodyguards. Between them stood someone Colin had never seen before, a small, fit man with white hair, Edward Stillman apparently. Jude Modesto had taken refuge behind Stillman and his guards. Ragnar looked like he didn't care how many men he'd have to wade through to get his hands on the fat little antiques dealer. One of the bodyguards reached menacingly into his coat, but Stillman raised a tanned, well-manicured hand. Now, now, no violence, please. Let's keep the guns holstered. Mr. Modesto didn't sell you out, Gideon. I have been his main buyer for your collection for some time. I just insisted he let me meet with you in person. He didn't know anything about our previous acquaintance. Previous acquaintance? You call trying to steal my wife, my farm, and my life's work a previous acquaintance? You really have a way with words, Stillman. Gideon got up from his chair. Come on, Ragnar. Not so fast. Stillman gestured, and one of the burly men moved forward. He and Ragnar stood chin to chin, staring at each other. They were about the same size, but Stillman's guard looked about thirty years younger. Colin pulled back. Some bodyguards, he thought, and felt a hysterical giggle rising inside him. I could be waiting back here to kill this Stillman guy, and they didn't even search the place. Colin suddenly realized what was really at stake. These were bodyguards, armed bodyguards. If he made a suspicious noise, they would probably shoot him first and ask questions later. The urge to giggle suddenly felt much more like an urge to throw up. Colin clenched his teeth. Ah, excuse me. The urge to giggle suddenly felt much more like an urge to throw up. Colin clenched his teeth together violently. He didn't want to do either. And I'm going to stop there because there's still about 10 minutes or so left in the chapter. And uh, it'll take me about 15 after the 10 or 15 after the hour. And I would prefer to save that for next time because I think the chapter after it's a bit short. So that will maybe work out. So we will leave everybody there in Jude Modesto's office. For some reason, I've gone out of focus again at least on my version. Um, we will leave them there in Jude Modesto's office with Ragnar and Gideon and Colin hiding behind the screen and Mr. Stillwell, St Stillwell and uh, Stillman, excuse me, and uh, his two bodyguards. And we will come back. Um, again, I have no, I'm looking at this completely blurry picture. I think it's me, but it could be almost anybody. Um, I have no idea if that's what you're seeing, but if you are, I congratulate you because it's probably better than looking at a very <laughs> well-focused picture of me. It's probably a little easier on the eyes. Anyway, so it is now just about eight o'clock my time. And with that, I am going to thank you for joining me and thank you for being here and uh, all that good stuff. So, um, sorry, I just caught, <laughs> I just caught sight of a confusing comment I'm going to have to come back to at some point. Anyway, so just want to tell you, I will be back next Sunday morning, uh, first at the 1 a.m. my time, Pacific Daylight Time, early hour, and then at 7 p.m. again this time slot. Um, and I hope you will join me then for either or both. And as usual, I want to thank you very much for joining me and encourage you, urge you even, to take good care of yourselves until next week and take good care of the folks around you too. And we will all make it through tough times together. And yeah, that's pretty much the name of that tune. So again, thank you for joining me. Have a good Sunday night, wherever you may be or 
whatever the, whatever other part of the world you might be in and whatever time zone you might be in, it's all the same. Have a good time. Be good. See you next week. Okay. Thanks. Good night.